seen so many healings that we've lost track and that's a good problem to have yes mm -hmm. some of those healings do stand out i remember a few of them like there were yesterday one of the first big ones was 2006 i was at an andrew womack conference as a prayer minister pretty much a newbie and a young lady came up she was about 22 years old and she said she had pain in her abdomen abdomen and needed prayer I just started praying for her, and the word of wisdom came. And I told her, you've had surgery, haven't you? The sur surgeon cut the nerve. That's why you've mm -hmm. got numbness. And she goes, yes, that's right. So we said, let's pray for that nerve. We started praying for the nerve, and just got a little way into it. But I got another word. God says, you don't need a healing. You need a creative miracle. He needs to create nerve tissue to join those two nerves together. She goes, okay, let's go. <laughs> so I prayed for that, and just a little while in, she said, I feel tingling. I haven't felt tingling in years. And then I got another word. I said, what you need to do is leave now and go to your room and just spend the rest of the afternoon. That was a morning session. And just thank God for what he's doing and come down tonight and tell me what happened. And she willingly left, and I thought, oh, man. I've never gotten words like that before. I hope they were right. I just sent her out of the meeting. They were right. God was faithful. That evening she came down and said, I am healed. Amen. That was neat. Amen. Those were gifts of the Spirit. Gifts of the Spirit are powerful. Yes. They work every time. Mm -hmm. Remember last May, I was a prayer minister again at Andrew Armit Conference in Northern Virginia. And the woman who was leading the prayer ministry told us that she was looking for frozen shoulders. That was on the second evening. She wanted frozen shoulders healed, and she was looking for that. So we started praying for people, and that was a unique night, at least for me. Several of the prayer ministers got every person healed who came up. Wow. Every one, except maybe a few who got improved. That was awesome. And about the third or fourth person that came up was... Oh, in her 50s, maybe 60, and she couldn't raise her shoulder, her arms above shoulder level. They would stick here with pain. And she asked for prayer. Instead of gifts of the Spirit, I used my authority as a believer. I commanded those shoulders to be made whole. I commanded them to loosen up. And after a little while, one shoulder went up. She said, I can move it. It's great. What about the other one? She couldn't move that other one. So that's fine. Let's pray for that. Sort of speaking to that shoulder, commanding it to be loose. And while my hand was on her shoulder, I felt it go pop. Mm -hmm. went, Ooh, did you feel that? She goes, Yes, I did. Mm -hmm. What can you do now? The hand went up and said, My shoulders, they're healed. And just as she said that, the lady who said, I want to see two shoulders healed, mm -hmm. walked right behind. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Praise God, those things happen. That's the authority as a believer. Yeah. When you combine that with gifts of the Spirit, that's an awesome thing. Mm -hmm. Just a couple weeks ago, we were in a home group meeting, and a woman there was asking for prayer that she had a cyst on the nerve right behind her big toe. It was right behind the joint in her big toe. And she was asking for prayer, so Rosemary prayed for it, commanded it to leave, and nothing happened. So she thought, okay, she put her shoe back on, still hurt. She came back the next week, it was gone. It just took a while. 
Those things are great. They're great. You know, the people we trained under were not about bringing attention to themselves. They were about reproducing themselves and the people. And that's our heart as well. I want you healed. That's great. I don't want to minimize that at all. But I want you to know that healing is normal for Christians. Mm -hmm. You need to know how to go out and pray for people and get them healed. And that's what I've been doing in my teaching. I'm trying to give you the background so you can pray for people and get them healed. Mm -hmm. I started this series back in February with a teaching I call The Doors Are Open. And I was explaining that God has removed every barrier between him and you, between his power and you, between his love and you, between you and his healing power. He's removed all those barriers. He nailed them to the cross. What remains are barriers we've constructed over the years, that we aren't worthy, that that just can't happen to us. And my teaching was trying to show you that, no, God's not going to change. You can't change him, but you can change yourselves. The doors are open. The next teaching I taught was right along the same lines. What does God think of me? And I showed from Isaiah 54 that he will not, he will not remove his covenant of peace from you. He will not rebuke you. He will not be angry with you. That is his promise. He says, as the waters of Noah to me, this is what this is like. That means it's an unconditional promise. God loves you. You can't do anything about it. Sometimes that's a real good thing. Mm -hmm. And the last time I taught, do you have enough faith? And the answer to that is, yes, you do. Romans 12, 3 says he gives to each one of us a measure of faith, the measure of faith. We all have that faith. And 2 Peter 1, 1 tells us it's apostolic quality faith. You don't work it up. You don't have to improve it. What you need to do is get rid of your unbelief. <clears throat> and I taught those in detail. I don't have time to go reteach them now, but they're on the church website. It's www.gracefaithfellowship.com. And if you look under audio teachings, you'll find it under healing doors are open. What does God think of me? And do I have enough faith? In future teachings, I'm going to go into the spiritual principles you need to put those to get consistent healing. You need to put those principles into effect. I'm going to go into that. But tonight I want to go into the topic, what is faith? I'm sure you've heard that you need faith. Faith is the key to Christian life. Faith is the key to healing. Faith appropriates what God has already provided by faith, by grace. But have you ever studied what faith is? It is so much more than just believing. So the title of my talk tonight is, What Exactly Is Faith? And my scripture reference is Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, mm -hmm. the evidence of things not seen. In previous messages, you know, I've talked about Karis Healing School. Some of you may have heard that. Karis Bible College in Woodland Park. They open their doors every Thursday to the public. And they teach healing. They have worship surrounding healing. What God has already done. His current presence. That the power is here to heal. You're not going to hear any worship begging God's power to come down. Begging him to show up. Because he's already there. They have testimonies concerning the healings that occurred the previous week. Every week they have testimonies. They have teaching on healing. They have trained prayer ministers that pray for people to get healed. And in our two and a half years in that ministry, just my informal informal poll, about one in three got healed when they came up. But can you imagine what would happen on the mm -hmm. peninsula if people came up to be healed in every church and one in three got healed? Yeah. It would be in the daily press. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Probably negatively, but it would still be in the daily press. <laughs> And that's what happened on a regular basis. Well, there's an even bigger healing event there that occurs annually. They call it the Healing is Here Conference. And it's four consecutive days in mid-August that amounts to eight back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back healing schools with more uh, intensity on training people to pray for each other. They limit attendance to 2,000 people. 
because the, that's how big their facility is. It's just recently grown, so they may have more this year. And people come from around the country, even around the world, to get there because they value it. And session by session, more people get healed. By the last day, they ask for a show of hands on how many are healed. And every time, without fail, it's more than half. Over a thousand people in four days get healed. You know, how, how does that happen? Well, they give sound teaching on healing to give people a foundation, and that is essential. They train their prayer ministers, and that's really beneficial. One of the main things they do is they raise your level of expectation. They are bold about the fact that healing is going to occur, that healing is normal. And like I said, the worship centers on God's presence, his love, his healing power that is there. And they have ongoing healing manifestations that they celebrate. They're just bold about the fact that healing is going to occur, that healing is normal. In medical circles, they don't want to build up your hopes. Mm -hmm. They want you prepared for the worst. Mm -hmm. Christian healing involves a confident expectation of good. In fact, that's the definition of New Testament hope, a confident expectation of good. And that's an essential ingredient of faith, which we're going to talk about tonight. I have to stir myself up continually when it comes to healing. And you should too. 2 Timothy 1.6 says, I remind you, Paul talking to Timothy, I remind you to kindle afresh or to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. You know, if you don't stir yourself up, you are going to settle to the bottom. That's just how it works. <laughs> healing or any successful walk in the Christian life doesn't just happen. You have to stir yourself up to be effective in praying for the sick and praying for yourself. You really, really have to renew your mind. You have to change the way you think to stir yourselves up. Romans 12, 2 is so important here. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what, it will, what the will of God is, that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. The world will tell you that sickness is normal. Mm -hmm. Don't be conformed to that. You renew your mind with the word, with sound teaching on the word, and it will transform the way you think. It will enable you to understand God's will. To you, it will become good, acceptable, and perfect. And part of God's will is to heal. He wants you well. Jesus never turned away anyone who wanted healing, and no one ever left unhealed. 3 John 1, verse 2, John is praying. He says, Beloved, I pray that in all respects you may prosper and be in good health just as your soul prospers. I am certain John was not praying against the will of God there. <laughs> I pray that you be in health and prosper, even as your soul prospers. So you want to stir yourself up, I hope. You want to stir up your faith. But what is faith? Let's study it and find out. I think the results will be kind of surprising. About 15 years ago, I remember being under a pastor who started teaching on this verse. He said, faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. And he kept saying, faith has substance. It's substance. Faith is substance. It's substance you hope for. And I'm thinking about that. Said, That's not doing me any good. He might as well say, faith is stuff you hope for. How can you get any more wishy-washy than that? Faith is stuff. But it is really important stuff. And it's really specific stuff. Right here in chapter 11 of Hebrews, it mentions that Abel offered a better offering by faith. Enoch was taken into heaven without dying by faith. Noah built the ark by faith. Abraham obeyed God by faith. Sarah conceived by faith. Joseph blessed Jacob and Esau by faith. Moses 
parents hid the baby Moses by faith. Moses valued being a Jew more than an Egyptian by faith. The Jews passed through the Red Sea by faith. And there are all sorts of other people who are mentioned as having operated by faith. You finally get to verse 6 of Hebrews 11, and it says, Without faith it is impossible to please him, to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. A rewarder. Rewarder. Bad things don't come from God. The only bad thing Jesus said we'd have due to our faith is persecution. Not sickness, not poverty, not lack. The persecution. Yeah. And persecution is not from God, it's from other people, and it's from Satan. Jesus himself said in Mark 10, verses 29 to 30, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mothers or father or children or farms for my sake and the gospel's sake, but that he will receive a hundred times much as much now in this present age, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and farms, along with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. Jesus is saying you will receive a hundred times as much. Everything you leave, you get back in this life. When I hear pastors teach about this, they get hung up on persecution. Jesus almost puts that as a footnote. By the way, there's going to be persecution. And I'm going to tell you how to handle it. But there's so much benefits. You need to remember the benefits. John 16, 33, he says, These things I have spoken to you that you might have peace. For in the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. God gives special grace to those suffering persecution so that they overcome the world in him. Nero was a first century Roman emperor and he persecuted, persecuted the Jews horribly. He would impale them on, on uh, sticks, sharpened sticks right up to their bodies, burn them at the stake. And it's an historical fact that the Christians would sing while they were being tortured, and Nero would put his fingers in his ears, go, why did these Christians sing? They tortured him while he was trying to torture them because they'd overcome the world. Romans 5 and 17 says, For if by the transgressions of the one, that's Adam, death reigned through that one, much more will those who receive an abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life. That's now through one Jesus Christ. No matter the circumstances, if you know Jesus, he will reign in life. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, God's talking to his people. He says, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for calamity to give you a future and a hope. The Hebrew word is so much more rich than what you can get in English, just a word-for-word -word translation. He says, I have plans for welfare. The Hebrew word means health, prosperity, peace. That's his plan for you. It is not calamity. In the Hebrew for calamity is adversity, affliction, distress, injury. That's not his plan. That does not come from God. In fact, John the Apostle lived through a number of persecutions, and he tells us in 1 John 5, 4, whatever is born of God, that's you and me, overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Our faith overcomes persecution. Our faith overcomes sickness, if you know what your faith is. John 16, 33 says, Jesus has overcome the world. And now John tells us that it's our faith that has overcome the world. Faith is a supremely important thing to understand. And one thing you can say, whatever faith is, it's really powerful. All the important people in the Old Testament seem to have it and operate by it. So you would think the Old Testament would have a lot to say about faith. But in the King James Version of the Old Testament, the word faith only shows up twice. Did you know that? Only twice. Well, how can that be? It shows up in Habakkuk 2.4. It says, the just will live by faith. That's 
referenced in the New Testament several times. It shows up in Deuteronomy 32, 20. It's talking about the Israelites who forgot God, and God says he will hide his face from them because they are children who have no faith. And that's it. What's up with that? All these great Old Testament characters were operating by faith, yet the Old Testament barely uses the term. There's a reason. It's because in the Old Testament, the Hebrew word that's translated faith only twice is much more often translated this way. Steady. It's in Exodus 17, 12. Shortly after the Israelites got out of Egypt, they have seen the Red Sea, the Amalekites attacked them. And Moses is up on the hillside, and as long as he holds his arms up, and the, uh, the rod of God up, he holds them steady. The Israelites are winning. And his arms get tired, and they come down unsteady, not with faith, if you will. And the Amalekites start to win. And he goes through that series a couple of times. Israel wins, the Amalekites win, and finally Aaron and Hur come up. And they hold up his arms. They make them steady, faithful. And the Israelites win. There's a great lesson there about Lone Ranger Christianity. Sometimes you need a fellow Christian to keep you steady. Amen. It's often translated truth, as in Deuteronomy 32.4, where it says, God's work is perfect. He is a God of truth. Psalm 100, verse 5. Is truth and there endures for all generations. Same word for faith. And it's translated faithfulness as in trustworthy or worthy of trust multiple times. So the Hebrew word here, it's pronounced something like umunah, means firmness, security, steadfastness, worthy of tr trust, truth. And all of those are facets or their elements of faith. There's a principle of biblical interpretation called progressive revelation. As you go through the Bible, God reveals more and more about himself. And you can't ignore what happens later as you read something earlier in the Bible. Amen. And as you go through, you get more and more information about faith and other biblical principles. For instance, Job's one of the oldest books in the Bible. But Job himself, he didn't know squat about God. He had no covenant with God. He didn't have the Holy Spirit. He didn't have the armor of God. He didn't have the mind of Christ. He didn't have the Old Testament books, as far as we know. The only thing he really got right was right at the end, chapter 42, when he got a revelation of God, and he said, I was talking about what I didn't know. I repent in dust and ashes. So don't make your theology based on Job's words. The writer got Job right. He's reporting it right. But Job himself was pretty messed up. Mm -hmm. And yet one of the things we do with Job constantly, we make worship songs out of it. The Lord gives and the Lord <laughs> takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Job said that. He was dead wrong. <coughs> but we use that. It gets into our theology. I'm sick. The Lord must have taken away my health for a reason. Someone died. God needed him more than I did. I'm poor. I've lost all my money. God, God must be teaching me a lesson. That is not God. Amen. God, by his nature, is a giver. Mm -hmm. God so loved the world that he gave. John 3, 16. We learn more and more about God as he deals with his people. And we will learn more about him as he reveals his character as he often does through his names. And the very first name he gives himself, other than I am, is Jehovah Rapha. I am the God who heals. Other people have given him names before that, but this is the first name he gives himself. I think that's significant. God wants you to know him as the God who heals. And it shows up in Exodus 15, verse 23 to 26 says this, when they came to Marah, they could not drink of the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the name of it was called Marah. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, what shall we drink? And he cried to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, which when he had cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. Mm -hmm. There he made for them a statute and an ordinance, and there he proved them 
And he said, if thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and will do what is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon you, which I brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that heals you. I'm not the Lord that makes you sick. I am the Lord that heals you. Don't you think Moses was scratching his head when he went through that? You know, what's this tree about? Why didn't God just fix the waters? Why did he have me throw a tree in it? And what does the tree have to do with obedience and healing? I'm sure Moses was just confused as we would be if it wasn't for the cross. But on this side of the cross, we know that tree was a foreshadowing of the cross. Mm -hmm. We know that to change a bad situation, we have to apply the cross to the problem. Mm -hmm. And in that cross are all the promises of God, which are yes and amen mm -hmm. in Jesus. Amen. And we know that obedience today is believing Jesus. John 6, 29, this is the work of God, that you believe in him who he has sent. That's his work. In obedience, in believing Jesus, you get healing. When you believe in all Jesus is, when you know that you know what his promises are, and you know that he make, who makes those promises is absolutely reliable, trustworthy, and true, then you know that God is Jehovah Rapha, is the God who heals you. I'm going to get back to those promises in a moment. But Jehovah Rapha, the first name God wants to be known by. I am the God who heals. That's why in that great summary statement of Scripture in Acts 10, 38, it says, Jesus went around healing all who were oppressed by the devil because God was with him. That's progressive revelation. He's called other names. Jehovah Jireh, Abraham called him that, the God who provides, and he certainly does. It's called Jehovah Shalom. Gideon called him that. And we think, you know, Shalom, peace. It's just a state of being tranquil, untroubled. But again, the English doesn't really portray the Hebrew very well at all. When you look up the Hebrew word, that Shalom means completeness, safety, welfare, health, prosperity, peace, quiet, tranquility, contentment, peace in your friendships, peace in your human relationships, peace with God, peace from war. Knowing him as Jehovah Shalom is very important. Mm -hmm. And we learn the most about God and Jesus. He's the image of the invisible God, Colossians 1.15. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father, John 14.9. That's progressive revelation, and it's the same way with faith. There is progressive revelation. As you go through the Old Testament, you learn more and more about faith as you learn more and more about God. The two have to go together. God is the one you're having faith in. And then you get to the New Testament, and the nature of God and the nature of faith is opened up more fully. So from the Old Testament, we know that faith is something that is steady, steadfast, firm, worthy of trust. It is truth. Isn't that interesting? It's truth. Mm -hmm. That implies not being in faith as being in a lie. <laughs> you can think about that. And then you get to the Gospels, and you find that even mustard seed faith, tiny faith, is enough to move mountains. Matthew 17, verse 20 to 21, the disciples were asking Jesus why they were unsuccessful in driving out a demon. And Jesus said, because of your unbelief, not because of their lack of faith, their unbelief. For verily I say to you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing will be impossible for you. Unbelief can exist side by side with belief or with faith. If some characteristics of faith are steady, steadfast, firm, worthy of trust, truth, then unbelief must be unsteady, not firm, not worthy of trust, not truth. So what's the remedy for that? 
always it's the word of God the word of God is trustworthy and true it will renew your mind Romans 12 2 so with all this do you start to see why Hebrews eleven six says without faith it's impossible to please him for he who comes to God must believe that he is and he's a rewarder of those who seek him you have to approach God knowing he's truth and that he's worthy of trust there is no wavering with him it's impossible to please God and think that he's untrue, untrustworthy or a liar. He has made promises, and one of those is healing and is trustworthy. And then Hebrews 11, 1 gives what I think is the ultimate revelation of what faith is. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Finally, I came back to substance where I started. Faith is substance. It is substance, but the Greek word for that is hypostasis. Stasis means to stand, and hypo means under. Literally, it means to stand under or be a foundation. Faith is the foundation. It's that upon which everything else is built. From the Old Testament, we learn that the characteristics of faith are steadiness, trustworthiness, truth. Now that we see Faith is our foundation. It's our rock. Does that remind you of anyone? <laughs> I hope it does. Sounds like Jesus to me. <laughs> it is almost impossible to separate biblical faith from the person of Jesus. We see that most clearly in the King James Version. Galatians 2.16 says this, Knowing that a man is not justified by works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. And in 1 Timothy 13 and 14, Paul says, He was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly and unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. So what is this faith of Christ Jesus? And the Old Testament Hebrew tells us it's truth, steadiness, trustworthy. New Testament Greek is very similar. So Hebrews 11.1 1 is saying, faith is the foundation of things hoped for. So truth, steadiness, trustworthiness is that foundation. Hypostasis is also a legal term, and on the legal side, it basically means title deed. So faith is the title deed of things hoped for. Hmm. When you have the title deed, you own it. Hmm. It's yours. Faith is the title deed and foundation of things hoped for. Hmm. And biblical hope is not a wishy-washy thing. It's not, I don't know if this happens, but I sure hope it does. It's not that. Biblical faith, biblical hope, I'm sorry, is certain. In the Bible, hope is a positive expectation of good because it is based on who Jesus is. It is based on his character. So let me go through Hebrews 11, 1 with you. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Faith is the foundation of things hoped for. Faith is the title deed of things hoped for. Mm. Faith is the title deed and foundation for a positive expectation of good. The faith of Jesus is that title deed and that foundation for a positive expectation of good. So in the end, Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection is the title deed, is your title deed, and is your foundation for that expectation of good. Knowing who Jesus is and what he thinks of you is that foundation. Knowing Jesus is the substance for a positive expectation of good. And your faith is really powerful. It's really powerful. God gives it to you, Romans 12, 3. It's apostolic quality, 2 Peter 1, 1. But you know, it can be stopped up just like that by unbelief. 
Remember the father of the epileptic boy? Mark 9, 22 to 24, he's explaining to Jesus the problem as if Jesus needs to know. And he says, it, being an evil spirit, has often thrown the boy into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible for him who believes. And immediately the boy's father cried out and said, I do believe. Help my unbelief. What was his unbelief? It was, if you can. He didn't really know who Jesus was. He didn't know what Jesus came to do. He didn't know that Jesus wanted to cast out that evil spirit. His unbelief was, if you can. Not only could he, he wanted to. You remember Jairus, the synagogue ruler, who asked Jesus to come and heal his daughter. His daughter was near death. And as on, they were on their way to heal her, Jairus got a message that his daughter had died. Don't bother the teacher anymore. Jesus heard that and he immediately turned to Jairus and he says in Mark 5, 36, Do not be afraid, only believe. Why would he be afraid? Because he didn't know Jesus, didn't know what Jesus came to do, didn't know he was the resurrection and the life. So he was afraid. Did you know that fear and unbelief are first cousins? They will stop up your faith. Unbelief is really not knowing who Jesus is and what he came to do. In effect, it's believing a lie. 1 John 3, 8, the Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. Mm -hmm. Sickness is a work of the devil, whether it came from original sin, through other sin, through a direct attack on your body, it's a work of the devil, and Jesus came to destroy it. Hallelujah. Acts 10, 38, you know of Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and power, and how you went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed with the devil because God was with him. That's what Jesus came to do. And finally, there's this verse, John 10.10. 10. I had a pastor who used to call it the great dividing line of scripture, and it is. It says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. You know how many people attribute to God characteristics of the, of the thief? I've lost everything. God must be teaching me a lesson. That's the thief. That's not God. Mm -hmm. right. My daughter died. God must need her more than I do. That's the thief. He came to kill. That's not God. That's a dangerous thing to do. But Jesus says, I, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Mm -hmm. And that abundantly is a rich Greek word. You look it up and it means this, over and above, more than is necessary, super added, exceedingly abundantly, supremely, something further, much more than all, superior, extraordinary, surpassing, and uncommon. That's why Jesus came. That's the kind of life he wants you to have. But you need to know it. If you don't know it, it's not going to do you any good. Amen. And Peter emphasizes that. 2 Peter 1, verses 1 to 3. The Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have received a faith of the same kind of ours. It's right there. A like precious faith. Their faith is just as good as Peter's. Hmm. To those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours by the righteousness of God our uh, and Savior, Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and in Jesus our Lord, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness for, through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. There's so much there. Grace and peace can be multiplied to you, not just given you, not double, multiplied by the knowledge of God. Knowing God, that's where grace and peace comes from, not through your own efforts. 
And it says, everything pertaining to life and godliness comes by the true knowledge of him. Faith, when you have a true knowledge of God, is the key to everything pertaining to life and godliness. Mm -hmm. What else is there? Hmm. What need do you have that does not pertain to life and godliness? Now, I don't say that lightly. I have problems. There are places that I have not yet overcome. But I know those are places where I have a knowledge problem. I don't know God well enough in those areas. I'm in the process of renewing my mind in those areas, reading the word, getting it into my soul and spirit. That this is who God is, and this is what he wants for me. I hope you're in that process too, stirring yourself up, renewing your mind. And there's one more reason to know Jesus. Really? Beautiful. Really know him. Experientially know him. 2 Corinthians 1.20 For all the promises of God are in him, yes, and in him, amen, to the glory of God by us. You just breeze by that. All the promises are granted to us in Jesus. Forgiveness, salvation, prosperity, peace, and more, they're all granted to us for a reason. So the world knows that knowing God makes a difference. Mm -hmm. yeah. And when it makes a difference in your life, it says right here, it brings glory to God by us. Yes. When God makes a difference in your life, people see it and it mm -hmm. brings him glory. Yeah. Finally, faith is the evidence of things not seen. Colossians 1, 15 to 17, it's talking about Jesus. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Think about that. The atheist shaking his fist at the heavens and saying there is no God. His brain is being held together by Jesus himself <laughs> until he comes to realize the truth. What a mercy. Yes. And in other words, Jesus is the evidence of things not seen yet. He's the reason and means for all creation. And he holds all things together. So Hebrews 11.1, 1, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. True faith in Jesus cannot be separated. Jesus is the foundation and title deed of all your positive expectations of good. And I hope you have a lot of positive expectations. Jesus is the evidence of things we have not yet seen. Amen. All the promises of God are granted to us in him. When you know him, when you have faith in him, then you know the truth of him. So let me give you my interpretation of Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now knowing Jesus experientially and factually and all his promises are the foundation and title deed of all our positive expectations of good. Jesus is the evidence and proof of things we haven't seen yet mm -hmm. faith is knowing jesus and what he came to do faith is the revelation of the will of god in your heart which produces certainty it produces conviction and it produces action faith is knowing jesus really knowing him and what he came to do that is the key to healing prosperity peace and overcoming the world mm -hmm. So let me pray for you and me. Lord, help us know you better. Help us put aside all our unbelief. Help us know that all your promises are not only good, but they are trustworthy, true, and dependable. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that in your love, that amazing, unexplainable love you have for us, that you came that we may have abundant super added extraordinary love thank you Jesus thank amen you.
And as we come to a close, we want to invite those of you who um, have an area of need that you want agreement in. Pastor Bob, myself, we'll be up front after the service to minister to all those who are in need of one-on-one -on -one ministry. So let us pray. Father, I thank you. I thank you for your word, the word that was delivered tonight. Lord, I ask that the word that was sown will be multiplied in their hearts. That you will water the seed of the word that was sown. That will grow, grow and flourish in the hearts and minds of your people. That they will walk in the knowledge of you. Have an experiential knowledge of you like never before. Continue to grow and their love for you as they receive and abide in the love that you have given to them. Father, we give you praise. We give you praise tonight. We thank you for your faithfulness. And as we leave this place, remember your presence. We give you all the glory, honor, and praise. Leaving with an expectation of good. Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.